Well, good morning. And again, I just love being here. And today I will be talking about the fourth part of our series in creating fruitfulness and it's risk-taking mission. But just to touch on what we've, you know, what's gone before, as they say in TV, um, the first sermon was about extravagant hospitality and how by being welcoming and going beyond what people expect, we can show the love of God and invite people and make them feel welcome in our community and be fruitful. And by being passionate in our worship, the second sermon, by really being not just worshiping with our mouths, but with our whole being, our spirits, not just in, on Sunday, but throughout the week, we change the perception of what it means to be Presbyterian. You know, we're not the frozen chosen. We're actually likable. We're actually engaged. We're alive with our glorification of our God and what he's done for us. And then last week, we talked about intentional faith development, how as we grow and as we intentionally challenge ourselves to be better, how our whole understanding and the depth of our love of God grows because we understand how much he loves us. And we have the courage, I think, to do this, what we'll talk about today, risk-taking mission and service. You know, and I want to, you know, we do mission, we do service, but I want to talk about why the adjective, and I put it together, risk-taking, is here. Um, how do I put this? Presbyterians are conflict-adverse, or, or they, like, they like to mitigate the risks as best possible. And I'm not against, you know, mitigating risks. I like, you know, taking seat, you know, wearing seatbelts. I like making sure that I don't do dumb things like I did when I was a teenager. There are so many dumb things as a teenager and I look back and I am so glad that Facebook or Instagram or TikTok doesn't exist, didn't exist back then. But more than that, I'm thankful that I managed to survive with most of my limbs and fingers intact, you know, because I was a teen boy and I acted like one. But today, as we get older, we are less averse to risk and change. But we look at this hard scripture passage and it speaks to us and calls to us in so many ways that we're supposed to go and take risks. You know, look at the context of this message. Jesus is sitting with his friends as, uh, as you know, as Anne talked about, this wasn't a message to thousands of people. This was a message to his disciples, people who walked with him, understood him. And as Jesus outlined what it meant to put everything that they were learning into place, this is what he told them. And I think it's really important for us, the followers of Christ, disciples, you know, we've been pared down in many ways by this pandemic. I mean, there are a lot of people who are casual Christians, but you're here on a Sunday morning choosing to give it your time during a pandemic online in this uncomfortable way. And we're called to do this work, even with a pandemic going on. You know, I just want to touch on the context as he put, points out. You know, today we still face hunger. And in fact, the pandemic has caused a spike in hunger. So when we talk about, when he says, feed the hungry in this passage, we're talking about a situation and a time where food insecurity has flared. There are about 52 million people in the United States. That's about a fifth of our total population who face food insecurity. That's 17 million more than at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's only getting worse. So we're called to feed. You know, we're also called to take care of the thirsty. And, you know, we talk about spiritual thirst, but there's also the physical thirst about potable water. Um, the UN, UN High Commission for Refugees believe there are about 1.1 billion people who lack access to water, to clean water. 
and about 2.7 billion experience water scarcity, which means for at least a month a year or more, they are cut off from good, clean drinking water. But even in America, there are people cut off from good water. And as you know, most of those folks are the poor. And Jesus talks about it a lot and talk about it in the passage. I mean, this is a scene that's not unfamiliar to many of us who drive around who still go out. And in fact, it's gotten worse. You know, it's, uh, homelessness has surged about 12% in LA County, about 16% in the city of LA. Um, even while we've done a better job housing the homeless, and while the moratorium and evictions and um, other things have helped, uh, you know, those serving the homeless say the situation looks pretty dire. Um, I mean, I was watching a news report and one, one side of it was that the Ben and Jerry's in Venice Beach closed because the homeless have descended upon the beach. Well, those homeless have descended on the, on, upon the beach because there's more homeless. And um, while we're doing better at helping them, there's still such need. And of course, you know, let's talk about the sick. We're in the middle of a pandemic. 400,000 plus people have died. But more than that, um, if we just look beyond the people suffering from COVID, there are so many others suffering with normal ailments and diseases that we don't see because right now it's overwhelming. And I got to say, after all of that litany, all of that doom and gloom, so what does God expect of me? This is so big. This is so hard. This can be feel so overwhelming because I'm just one person with limited resources. We're just one church. What can we do? The first thing is, and I think the most important thing of this passage, is God expects us to do something. God expects us to try. Yes, the problem is big. The problem is hard. So how do we tackle it? How do we do it? And I think the how is a wonderful, you know, proverb, you know, aphorism, however you we do it one small bite at a time. How do we eat an elephant? We do it one small bite at a time. How do we change this situation? One small bit at a time. It feels hopeless, but there is hope when people act. You know, 30 years ago or so, I was at a conference um, at uh, Urbana, Champaign-Urbana, you know, just after Christmas. And I remember this guy, Tony Campola, I talked about him before, got up on stage and he said, 5,000 kids will die of hunger today, you know? Well, that doesn't, have, that doesn't happen anymore. Did you know that? It doesn't happen anymore. There are fewer, there are almost one half of the people who were in poverty when I was in high school are not in poverty anymore because of the things that happen in this world. Much of that agencies of the church. But we do it one small piece at a time. We feed the hungry. We reach out to the poor. We try. Because God has given, and God has given each of us an ability to do the mission. And it is risky at times, it is hard, and we have to do uncomfortable things. But how we do them is both profoundly simple and profoundly hard, because simple things can be really hard. You know, one of the, the simplest things to do in athletics is hit a white ball with a round stick, and it's one of the most difficult things in the world to do. So how do we do it? Now, how do we just, I want to give you three concrete steps. The first is pray. 
start a discussion with God about what that you want to do something to make a difference. And I don't only just pray individually, but pray as a community too. All of us should be praying to, and asking God, what should we as a church be involved in? How can we impact the community? How can I use the skills God has given to me? And as we pray, discuss, talk to people, say, you know, God has given me a burden to do this. What do you think? Discuss it with people you trust, help and recruit. And you know what something happens when you discuss? You, God may give you a burden to help, you know, the homeless on, in, in, in Encino or help the homeless or feed the poor or help uh, battered women. And as you discuss, as, you, as God leads you down that path, you'll discover as you look in your community that God raises up other people who not just agree with you, but want to assist you, want to help you. And when we start to work together, it becomes even more powerful. And you'll also discover that God has given you skills, special skills. I mean, one of my, it's so you might think, well, I'm a engineer, a doctor, a professor, a filmmaker, you know, a student. What can I do? God has given you the skills needed to accomplish the task. One of my favorite people I've encountered during my studies is a guy named Joseph uh, Botana. He is a professor of finance. He's an accountant. He's a CFO. He's an actuarial kind of guy. And, you know, we're talking about how he didn't know how he fit in with God's plan, what mission that God had given to him. So he was talking about, he's praying about it, and his heart for the church in Cuba, but he didn't know how to help. But he discovered that his denomination needed someone to go to Cuba to help with their books and their finances, to tell them how to use their money. So being a CFO, being a, being a teacher of accounting and you know, business management, that's what he does. He that's his mission, his ministry. And he helped, and he's helping the church in Cuba grow, to reach out and use their resources more effectively. That's his mission. But he was very nervous the first time he flew from, you know, from Minnesota or Wisconsin, Wisconsin down to Cuba. Even though he was a Cuban American, he hadn't been there. But he got down there and the gift of being able to speak the language, and understand the culture, were all in place. And that's the thing. God has given us skills and tools. And I can turn to people like Betsy in the community who has all of these gifts and the passion and the hunger and that she's not alone in that in our community. I know that there are so many others in our church that God has given gifts to. I see it in the care that Randy and Cliff have for people in our congregation. And those are gifts of compassion and care. And I can go through the list. In just a short time I've been here, seeing all of the wonderful folks who are willing to put out. And it makes me glad that we are a church that does the final thing. We have to act on God's leading, even when it's scary. Here's the thing. When we stake it, step out, we'll make mistakes. When we step out, we'll try to do things that don't work. It just happens, but that's okay. I think for me, the image for me is, is like a rock. You know, when a rock starts to move, even if it starts moving in the wrong direction, it's so much easier to change direction once we're in motion rather than trying to start when we're just sitting still. And the other thing is, if we are a church that acts, if we become a church that makes a difference, people are attracted to us. Because in their hearts, people want to belong to community because of their loneliness. But they also want to belong to something that makes a difference. You know, if you ask millennials and younger, why do they want to join a church? Why do they join different organizations? It's not for the socialization. It's to make a difference in the world. We're fortunate that our young people, and I put, I wish I could put myself in that group anymore, but I can't. I'm kind of old now, a little bit old, not much, but uh, they want to belong to things that matter. And when we say, if you belong to First Press Encino, 
And we make a difference because we touch so many lives. And if you belong to us, not only do we, we're going to be walking alongside of you to see what you're passionate, what you're gifted to do, and how you can change the world around you for the better. We'll help and energize that. And that's what we are all about. And when we ask that question, how can we take, do risk-taking uh, mission and service? We not only change the world, but we change one another. And we draw closer to God. And we can be the people that God says, you gave me food. You gave me water. You clothed me. You invited me in. And you made a difference. Thank you. And for me, I want to be the church that produces servants, that God says, good and well done, my blessed servant. Let's go to him in prayer today. Oh, precious Father, I thank you. It's scary to do ministry. It's scary to do mission. It's hard to focus on service when we want to be served. But help us, Lord, today to make those decisions, to take those risks, and to love you more. We thank you and we bless your name, O oh gracious God. Take these, the fruit, yourselves and bless them for your glory and bless us. Amen.